Thank you, Diana. What a great way to start off our service today, standing on the promises of God. No matter what's going on in the world outside, we can know that we can stand on the firm, solid foundation of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is enough. Well, I'd like to welcome you to our worship service this morning. Thank you for coming to join us this morning. And those of you who are watching online, we are so thankful that you have joined with us uh, this morning. We're, today we're starting a new series on a book that's often looked in the New Testament. It's a small four-chapter book, the book of Colossians. The author of, is Paul. And he's writing to a group of believers in a small town called Colossae. But the words that Paul wrote to those believers in that little church, in that little town, are still relevant for us today. As we'll see in the coming weeks, Colossians is about putting Jesus Christ first in our lives. We're going to explore the supremacy of Christ. Christ is supreme. We did a series on, on the king reigns right after Easter. And, and Jesus reigns over life. Jesus reigns over death. And one day, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to reign. He's going to come back in the fullness and power and glory and majesty. And we will reign with Jesus in heaven. Can you imagine that? Certainly that is our hope. Our lives matter today because we are in Christ. Our worth and our salvation is not based on who we are, but it's based on who Jesus Christ is. So many voices today tell us that, that our happiness and, self, and satisfaction in life are, are the most important things we, to, to be happy. That's, that's our goal in life. What do you want in life? I want to be happy. I want to find uh, fulfillment. But there's so much more in life to, to living and dying and, and just trying to get by day by day by day. The book of Colossians will show us what matters most. That living for Jesus is the best possible thing we can do. The author of this letter identifies himself as Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or a witness of Jesus Christ. Saul of Tarsus, as you know the, the story, you know that he was on his way to Damascus. Paul hated these new uh, Christians, these people who are talking about Jesus, who rose from the dead and, and Paul thought that was heresy and he was out to, uh, to put in prison or, or, or stop this, this new uh, revival or whatever that was going on. And so he had gotten permission to go to Damascus and to put uh, these Christians away to stop them. And, and, you know, on the road to Damascus, Paul had a close and supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ. And it struck, it knocked him off his horse, and it struck him blind as Jesus approached, approached him and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul, who was going in one direction, persecuting Christians, eventually he turned his life around and he became one of the most ardent defenders of the faith of Jesus Christ and the author of of much of the Bible that we have uh, today. He turned his life around. And God worked in the, supernaturally in the midst of this. And God sent Ananias to pray for Paul so that he could receive back his sight, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. And Saul's name was changed to Paul. And he was commissioned to be an apostle, an ambassador to the Gentiles, not only to the Jews, but Christianity expanded to all people who would believe on the name of Jesus Christ. And God specifically sent Paul for that purpose, 
to go to those who are non-Jews and talk about the good news of Jesus Christ and his provision for our sins. And so God sent Paul to preach to that church in um, Colossae, but that same message that, that Paul preached then is just as relevant for us today. Paul wrote this letter um, while he was in prison. And, and to me, this is just amazing. Uh, I'll say it. But, but he, he wrote four different letters while he was in prison. And he talked about, like in Philippians, be joyful and, and rejoice in the Lord. And I'll say it again, rejoice. And here he was in prison. But Paul knew that something was more important than the circumstances and the things going on around him. And he was inspired while he was in prison to write four of the books of the New Testament that we have. This book was written around, the, um, around 60 A.D., or about 30 years after Jesus had uh, risen from the dead. The other books are, are it's Colossians, Philippians... Uh, Ephesians and uh, Philemon. Those are the, the four books. They're called the prison letters. You know, Paul spent a lot of time in his life in prison, not because he did bad things, but because he chose to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you read Colossians and Ephesians side by side, you see that there's a lot of, of commonality in, in their language and the themes that were, were going on there. But also, there's, there's perhaps an even greater uh, relationship to the little book called uh, Philemon. And apparently, uh, Colossians and Philemon were written at about the same time in, in prison, the same place, and they were sent to the same place, and they were carried by the same messenger. In both of the letters, uh, Paul says that Timothy is with him. And he also mentions Archippus and says that Onesimus was, a, was accompanying the letters. In the greeting sections of Colossians and Philemon, there's almost an identical list of recipients who he was writing to. The bearer of the letter was Tychicus, um, who was a native of Asia Minor. So the original uh, people that it was written to, they were from Colossae, and it, it was a small town in Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. And we have a slide um, coming up. Paul was in Rome, and it shows uh, that how it was carried to uh, Colossae. Colossae is near Ephesus, and that whole area is Turkey. You see Italy um, over on the left. And um, so you see that journey of how um, this letter was, was carried to the church of Colossae. Now, Paul did not personally visit this city. He never went and, and personally established this church. It was probably started under uh, Paul's oversight by Epaphras. Well, why was Colossians written? There was always a reason uh, for these letters written, and, and so we're called to look and, you know, what's the situation going on? What is Paul addressing? It's inter interesting. There were always problems in the church. That's nothing new. It's something from the very beginning, because people, sinners like you and me, made up the church, and they still do um, today. But some people believe that Colossians was written because the, the church had fallen into some kind of a, of a false belief system where they, um, they, they worshipped angels, and the angels were mediators between uh, God and themselves. And so Paul was writing to uh, address that. Others suggest that, um, that Paul was trying to correct the false idea that if you return to the Jewish law, that you need to fulfill the Jewish law, um, that that's necessary for you to earn or merit your salvation. That's a false doctrine. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul tells them that things like circumcision, keeping the various feasts, not eating certain types of food, or observing the, the Sabbath have no salvific value. You know, you can do those things. You should do those things. They're, they're good things to do, but they're not going to get you into heaven. 
that comes only through Jesus. Whatever it was, they had made a they had made a place for Jesus in their system, but he was not first, and Jesus was not central um, to their faith. And that's what Paul is addressing in this epistle. Jesus must be preeminent in all things. Jesus must be first. Paul preached that um, a gospel that excluded both the Jewish and religion and Gentile religions from being the gospel. You can't be saved by being a Gentile. You can't be saved by just being uh, born into as, as a Jew. It was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that inaugurated in this new reign. And Paul was to be this new ambassador to go and to spread this good news, not only to the Jews, but specifically to the non-Jews or the, the Gentiles. And the message was, Jesus is the only way. Jesus is not one of the ways. That's a message that the world and even the church today needs to hear again. Jesus is not just one way to get to heaven. You hear that, that uh, mentality through all over the world. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So how does a little letter written in the first century to a small church in a small valley, a small town, how does that apply to our church in the Taze Valley in the 21st century? Well, glad you asked. <laughs> there seems to be a gap between them and, and us, but we're dealing with some of the same issues, aren't we? You see, the Bible is not just some dead uh, systematic theology. It's not just a book of history. It is a book of history, but it's the living word. And the Spirit brings life to that word, and the Spirit brings understanding to us, and the Spirit speaks to us as we read and study the word, as we uh, pray and, and allow the Spirit to speak to us as we read God's word. And those first century believers heard the Spirit of God speaking through Paul's Holy Spirit inspired letter to them and I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to be speaking to us as we continue in this study in this book in Colossians I believe God has a message that he wants us to hear today just as he did back 2,000 years ago and as we seek to hear what the Spirit is saying to us not everything's going to apply directly to us but if we listen, God is still speaking to his people through his Holy Spirit and through this book of Colossians. There's probably not anyone here who is tempted to worship angels. Anyone struggling with that problem that you're worshiping angels? Yeah, I, I didn't think that would be one of the, the sins we'd be struggling with today. But we do near, need to hear the co completeness that is we are in him. We are in Christ. And we can't do anything apart from him. Jesus said that I am the vine, you are the branches. And apart from me, you can do nothing. And when we know this, when we know that we are in Christ, however, it can soothe our anxieties and, and our concerns and free us from our, our pride to know that we are complete in him, not in me. It's not because of me that we accomplish things. You see, in, um, if you are in Jesus, you have all you need. So let's get started as, as we read Paul's introduction in uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul writes, Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy our brother 
Paul begins this letter just the, the normal way that, uh, that people wrote letters. You know, when, ours, when we write letters to, today, we say, you know, dear John, um, at the beginning, we say who it's to, and we sign it at the end, who it's from. Well, they did it uh, just the opposite. I mean, in, in the very beginning, um, I'm writing this letter to you. And so that's uh, just the technique that uh, was common of the day, and that's the way God's Word came down to us. Use some of the common methods of communication uh, during that day. Perhaps if Paul were alive today, maybe he'd be on Facebook or, or YouTube or Twitter or, or TikTok or something to communicate um, to the people and, and the method that people use today. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But, uh, but this was just a normal way. And Paul said that he is an apostle. He's an, an eyewitness. Now he says in, in Corinthians that he's like an abnormal apostle. An eyewitness, an apostle was an eyewitness of the life of Jesus Christ. They saw the miracles that Jesus did and the things Jesus did. And um, so they were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. Now, was Paul an eyewitness of Jesus Christ? No, he says that as if someone who was abnormally born, he had that encounter with Jesus Christ, a supernatural encounter, after Jesus had risen from the dead, and Jesus came personally to Paul, knocked him off his horse, struck him blind, so that Paul knew something was going on, spoke to um, to Paul. So he was, he was an eyewitness, but not the way the other apostles were. And he was chosen by the will of God. It was God's will that Paul do what he did. And Paul understood that, that it was God's will. Even if it meant him going to prison, nothing would dissuade Paul from doing what he knew God was calling him to do. It is um, it is great to de to desire. It is great to desire things in God, but it's important to remember that God chooses whom He will for the purposes He has designated. No one else could have done Paul's job the way Paul did it, and no one else can do your job the way you can do it. Now, Paul includes Timothy here, and he calls him our, our brother. The reason we call, we probably don't do it that much in our Presbyterian tradition, but, uh, you know, in, in some of the, the churches, you know, we call each other brother and sister, you know, we're brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ because we're a part of the family of God. We're baptized into Jesus' name. We're engrafted into the family of God, and we're filled with his Holy Spirit. The greatest thing that we can be in this life is members of the family of God. Have you ever wished you could be maybe like one of the, the Old Testament prophets? Have you ever thought you could live back in Bible times and, and just uh, experience things that, that they saw? Um, the old prophets inspired and, and proclaiming these things to the world. Well, Jesus said that the person who is the very least in the kingdom of God is greater than the greatest of the prophets. You think of the prophet Isaiah. And those of us who will just barely squeak in by our faith in Jesus Christ, we're going to be greater than Isaiah. If you're in the family of God, uh, you're a follower. You're in the family of God if you're a follower of Jesus. Now, Timothy's included in a number of Paul's letters, um, and he's, he's one of the, the senders. He's a son in the faith. Paul mentored him and, and taught him things. He, he, uh, Timothy was blessed, and his, his mother and his grandmother taught him the things of the faith, and, uh, and Paul just took him under his wing and, and mentored him. And Timothy was a very special companion uh, to Paul. Let's continue to Colossians 1, verse 2. To the saints and the faithful brothers in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. 
So it's written to the saints. Now there's more to this verse than meets the eye. Most of us, you know, as we start and read something like this, we just kind of skip over this first part, don't we? Uh, the introductions. But there's more to it than meets the eye. The recipients are saints and faithful brothers. Saints, now it's not a, a technical term. Did you know that you are, are saints? Well, I don't know about that. Saints doesn't mean that we're perfect. Saints means that we're followers in Christ. And through Christ, we are, we are, um, are seen as, as without sin. Not because of us, but because of Him. And um, to be saints means that you are set apart from God, by God, for specific purposes. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we're set apart by God for specific purposes. They are holy unto God, and, and holy means set apart. And Paul calls them faithful. They're faithful not because they're perfect, but because they keep showing up, they keep trying, they keep persevering. You don't get good to get to God. You know, I've said it before, you've heard it many times, but people will say, well, you know, as soon as I get my life together, I'm going to come to church and, and you know, I'm going to become a good Christian. But if you wait till you become good, you'll never get there, will you? We come to Christ and then we allow Him to mold us and shape us. And you come to God and then you get good through Him as the Spirit works in our lives. So the, faints, the, the saints and the faithful ones are in Christ in Colossae. And this is a setup for everything else that Paul has to say in this letter and what the Spirit is saying to us. They were in Christ by trust in the faithfulness of Christ through the baptism of water and the Holy Spirit. To be in Christ means that it is the realm in which they live out their lives. Everywhere we go, we are in Him. And that's, uh, th there is strength when we understand that, when we know that. Jesus gives us our identity. To be called a, a Christian means little Christ. We're, we're followers of Jesus. We belong to Him. We're simultaneously in Christ and in Colossae. And God chose them to be where they were in location in that small church, in that small community. And they were chosen to be set apart by Christ for a specific purpose. And so are we. God has chosen us in Christ to represent Him uh, here in Tays Valley. The epistle was also meant not just for those churches, but it was also meant to be circulated to other churches um, as they were popping up and the church began to grow uh, and, and spread. And so these letters were called circular letters and they were sent and, and, uh, to other churches as well because the message is central to our faith. And Paul wishes two things for them. One, he wishes grace and he wishes peace. Get what you don't deserve and peace. As we celebrated last Sunday on Pentecost Sunday, we live the Christian life through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And along with that is the peace that comes from knowing that we are complete in Him. And that's what peace is. It's a completeness. And when we know that we are complete, we don't have to struggle and worry and have anxiety about other things. Because when we have Jesus, we have all that we need. We're definitely not complete in ourselves. No matter what we do or what we achieve, we continually fall short of God's standards. Anyone uh, relate to that? Certainly I can. And so uh, Jesus extends his grace to us. He doesn't give us what we deserve. And he gives us peace. We can rest in him when you're weary and heavy laden you can come to him and find peace and rest this grace and peace comes from god our father and our lord jesus christ 
It's not enough to know God as Father. What? Satan believes in God. So, so often in the, in the world today, we, well, I believe in, in God. I believe there's a God, but he may not be the God of the Bible. It's a God that we make up in our own minds. You hear things like, well, my God would never, or, you know, you make statements like that. So we've created this God that we like, a God that ministers to us and helps us and serves us, rather than us recognizing the awesome, glorious, wonderful, majestic God of the universe and humbling ourselves before him and calling him Lord, submitting ourselves as slaves to Christ. That's just not a real popular concept uh, in our world today where everyone is demanding their own rights. But we are complete in him. Well, Satan believes in God, but he trembles the Jews knew that there was one creator God and they worshiped that God above all else and they tried to be good Jews. They tried to practice uh, the faith and the rituals um, and the traditions. Um, but there's more than that. Jesus calls us. He, he frees us. When we come to Christ, we are set free. The, tr the truth sets us free. Uh, and God revealed himself through Jesus Christ, through the person of Jesus. And that's what God chose Paul to do, to preach Jesus to the Jew and to the Gentile. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead, manifest in the form of, of Jesus. He is first in all things because he is God and he is enough. Apart from Jesus, we're incomplete. We were created in the image and likeness of God. Can you imagine that? We are created in the image and likeness of God. But the fall of Adam and Eve changed everything. The image of God that is in us was tainted and distorted by sin. Imagio, imagino, imagio um, Dei is the Latin trans translation of the image of God. I can't speak. But this phrase radically changes how we should see ourselves and how we live our lives. Since the image of God means that we are made with, with the image of God in us, it demonstrates how deeply God cares for us and loves us. As human beings, we are unique from any other uh, creatures on earth. We're the only part of creation that's made in the image of God. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. He emphasizes this. Male and female, he created them. Since we are made in God's image, it means that we are made specifically with, with qualities that reflect our creator. God created us with the ability to, to feel, to think, to love, to have morals, and be creative. Morally, mentally, and socially, we are made in the image of God. And when we know this, we can know that being made in the image of God manner, matters, and it affects us as human beings. The rest of God's creation, as wonderful and beautiful as it is, is not made in God's image. The earth, the planets, the plants, the trees, the sky, the ocean, and the animals were not designed to reflect God's image in the same way. They point us to God. We can see the glory and the majesty of God as we look at his creation, but not the image of God. Only humanity was formed in the image of God. And that makes us unique apart from all other of God's creation. And knowing that we are uniquely made in God's image 
should bring great joy to our souls and purpose to our lives. Since we are made in God's image, it means that each and every one of our lives are indispensable and of extreme worth to God. Life matters to God. Every person is valuable to God. Nobody is here by accident. You have a wonderful purpose uh, for your life filled with love, joy, and service to the Lord. Never doubt that for a second. By knowing that we are made in God's image, we are extremely valuable to God, we have worth, and we have been chosen by God, and He has a plan and a purpose for our lives. That should encourage us. The world tries to tell us that we don't have worth unless we look a certain way or have a certain degree or, or are successful at this or that. We're living in a death culture, aren't we? For many people, life has no value. From conception to death, from the beginning of life to the end of life. There are those fighting to take away life. From abortion to euthanasia, violence and death are among us. And this is always a consequence of moving away from God. Social media has a great impact on society today, doesn't it? Many of our young people, and people of all age, ages, to be honest, base their worth on how many followers they have, how many likes they get on, on social media. Many people today are growing up without knowing Jesus Christ and without having a basic knowledge of Christianity. They believe in what the world teaches us about our worth, which is based on what we do or what we don't do. The world and every other religion that I know of teaches a works-based righteousness. We're saved by what we do or don't do. Rather than knowing we have an intrinsic worth because we're made in the image of God, they believe that their worth comes from their grades or their appearance or other achievements. Needless to say, to try to obtain worth by the world standards is exhausting and impossible. It will completely change your life when you finally realize that we have worth because we're made in the image and likeness of God and that you are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Grace and peace through Jesus Christ is what the world desperately needs. If you too have struggled with self-worth, know that you have indescribable value because you're made in God's image. You are beautiful, wonderful, brave, strong, smart, and creative. You're capable of doing greater things because of Christ who is in you. Don't listen to the world's interpretation of worth because it's all lies. The Bible tells us that Satan is the God of this world, the prince of this world. And since Satan is the God of this age, we need to be very hesitant about the world's teaching because he is the father of lies. Jesus said we are either for him, for Jesus, or against him. Those are the only two options. You're either for Jesus or you're against him. There's no halfway. In John 10, 7 through 11, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever come before me were thieves and robbers, liars. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. And whoever enters through me, through Jesus, will be saved. That's the only way to be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. There's freedom in Christ. The thief, that is Satan, comes only to steal, 
to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We must make the right decision to obey God. Our free will gives us the option to do the right thing or to do the wrong thing. The sinful nature urges us to sin and disobey God. But we have, uh, we ha and so we have to actively go against our sinful nature, not just do what comes naturally. We have to make a choice to follow Jesus, to obey him. You see, God didn't create us as robots so that we do everything he tells us to. He created us with the freedom to choose. Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God. They only had one commandment. Don't do this. Don't eat of this. And they did it. They couldn't keep that. But the reality is none of us can follow God's law and get to heaven. So we need to obey him. And as we obey him, we prove that we love him. Even though we are presently made in the image of God, Throughout our lives, God is constantly conforming us, forming us and molding us into the image of him. So once we become a believer, God begins to, to mold us to be better, to reflect his image and light to others through the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And throughout our lives, God will constantly use bad situations, good situations, and everything in between to help mold us and shape us into his image. Since we are made into God's image, we are loved, cared about, and are extremely valuable to God. We are special among God's creations. God has made uh, uh, great and beautiful things, such as the oceans and the plants and the sunsets, and yet God has only made us through his image. And that makes us special. If you're questioning your self-worth as a human being, then you have immeasurable, know that you have immeasurable value and purpose because you are made in the image and likeness of God. And so remember, you are worthy. You are beautiful. And you are amazing just because God created you in his image and likeness. Let us go to him in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you now and realize we're talking about concepts that are probably bigger than our little minds can fully comprehend because we're talking about you and your image and likeness. But Father, by faith, we believe that you have called us, you've equipped us with your Holy Spirit, you have a plan and a purpose uh, for our lives, and we are valuable to you. Father, let us never forget that. Sometimes we get down and out uh, thinking about ourselves and life situations that come upon us, but let us rest in you when we are weary and heavy laden. And find that rest, that peace, that comfort. Let us remember that you are our provider. And you will give us everything that we need in order to do what you've called us to do. Lord, help us to make a difference. May we be encouraged by the fact that you have chosen us and called us into your family. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Thank you for joining us online as well. We're glad that you have chosen to worship with us as we study about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. When we have Jesus, we have enough. And so as we go out into the world, let us remember, as you go, no matter what's going on in the world, we can stand on that solid rock of Jesus Christ. And we can go in his power and in his love and we can make a difference. So go in peace. As you go, you can uh, leave your offering, which is a, a testament to your faith and provision of God in your life. So you can drop those off 
and the offering plates as you leave. And if you're watching online, there are instructions to how you can do that as well. Go now in peace.